Okay, thanks, Sheridan. So I'm going to be talking, like she said, about microscale uh, marketable fruit. Uh, one of the things I should, uh, qualifiers I should give you is that I'm going to focus a lot of this on what would be most appropriate to the Intermountain West, although some of the principles that we talk about are, are pretty universal. So um, with that kind of uh, caveat, I'm, my, my slides aren't advancing, Sheridan. Oh, there we go. Okay. So typically with fruit production, uh, if, if we're gonna go into commercial fruit production, we typically think about selecting the site that's appropriate for growing fruit. And in, I know that's kind of reverse from what micro scale farmers often do and that they, are, they have their site and they're trying to, to decide what they wanna do. So I wanna talk a little bit about what are the site characteristics that we need to be thinking about uh, in, in whether or not fruit production is appropriate for your particular particular situation. So the first thing that we talk about is the climate. And usually home gardeners and those that are getting into microscale farming think about uh, hardiness zone when they think about climate. And that's one important factor. That's the factor that tells you how cold it gets in the winter typically. So the, the coldest temperature of the year on average gives you hardiness zone. That's important, but it's not the only consideration. Um, the next thing that we need to think about, particularly in our high elevation mountain, intermountain west region, is spring temperature fluctuations. If we get warm weather, get the buds starting to move, and then we get a freeze, that can limit our production because the, the blossoms or flower buds, emerging flower buds will be frozen. So we typically want to think about our growing season length, and that's measured in frost-free or freeze-free days. And that's a really good indicator, probably for our climate, a better indicator of whether or not it's uh, something's going to be adapted than, say, midwinter coldiness, cold hardiness. Okay, so one of the things that, af that affects our climate, and particularly our microclimates, is inversions. Our high mountain valleys are very much prone to temperature inversions, where we get the cold air settles in the bottom of the valley and it's much colder down in the bottom of the valley than it is up on the benches. And so the, the growing season length can differ quite a bit. I pulled up some examples here of, this is freeze-free days of four different locations in Utah Valley, kind of uh, north central part of the state. Um, and you can see there from the Orem bench, we have 185 freeze-free days as a growing season. You move over to the Provo bench and it's a little bit less. Provo Airport, which is down cl close to Utah Lake, is 127 days. So you can see the difference there. And if you move west across the county uh, to, an, to another location, you've got basically the growing season that's half as long as it is in, on the Orem bench. So that just kind of illustrates how much variability we have. Um, from one location to the other, even within a fairly small geographic area. Um, my slides are slow to advance here for some reason. Sorry about that. I'm not sure why it's not advancing. Okay, besides climate, we need to think about um, our soil conditions. Um, there are going to be sessions this afternoon to talk about soil conditions, the, the soil depth, drainage and aeration, texture, pH, salinity, all those are important. Fruit crops generally like uh, coarse textured, well-drained soils, near neutral pH, and low salinity. So if you have any of these issues, that can become a limiting factor. So those are some of the things you need to be thinking about with, in terms of soils. Uh, water is also important. We live in a desert and water availability is critical. Uh, our fruit crops require 30 to 40 inches of water per year, and not just availability, but also water quality in terms of salinity, uh, pH, uh, carbonate, bicarbonate content, so how hard your water is. All those come into play when we think about, um, think about fruit crops, and having enough water and, and relatively good quality water is really critical. Okay, all these factors I've talked about are available on this, uh, in this fact sheet. This is a fact sheet that we have on our website, fruit.usu.edu, and it goes through microclimate, where you can get information on microclimate, soil factors, um, water quality issues, and so forth. Okay, next slide. Um, 
So as you think about this for your micro scale uh, situation, think about what is your most limiting factor and how are you gonna optimize this? Um, is it space? We're talking about micro scale. Typically that means you don't have a lot of acreage. So space can be a limiting factor. We've just talked about climate and growing season, um, water, soils, um, soil conditions, how much capital to invest. I, I would argue that the last two are probably two that you don't think about as much as you should, but are really the limiting factors. What is your, your time as an operator or what is your labor availability? And the other factor is, is light. Really space is, the, the limiting factor in space is light. Um, so what are the light requirements? The, a quote that I often hear is farmers don't, do not farm soil, they farm sunlight. And if you think about that, that's really the limiting factor is sunlight. And in the case of fruit crops, sun influences plant growth and vigor, yield. Um, whoops, whoop. that's not coming up right. Oh, sorry. The delay is causing me problems here, Sheridan. Um, so the plant growth and vigor is controlled by the amount of light available. Yield is influenced by uh, flower bud induction. Um, okay, I didn't advance that slide. Uh, fruit set is also a factor and, um, and fruit quality, the size, the color, sugar acid balance. One, one of the things to think about is I oftentimes get people asking me, you know, does this fruit crop grow with some shade? And the answer is yes, but will it produce fruit that you wanna eat? Probably not. Uh, a quote that helps me illustrate this is I had a, a strawberry grower from Florida joking one day and he said, if you're in the Northern part of the US in the winter time, if you wanna know what the weather was like last week in Florida, just go buy a quart of strawberries in the grocery store. And if they're sweet, it means we had sunny weather in Florida. And if they're tart, it means we had overcast weather. And that really illustrates the, the point in terms of fruit quality. Brent, would you like me to just advance your slides for you? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. It's the, sometimes they advance, sometimes they don't. So what are the factors that we need to think about? I think about whether or not it's appropriate as a, as a four-legged stool. So if we can look at the different legs there, Sheridan. Um, the first one is production issues. Will it grow here and can I grow it? I, those are the ones I've covered. The next one is the, the labor. And I like the, the story of the riddle, little red hen, who's gonna help me plant the wheat? And, and the question that becomes the answer when we're talking about any kind of enterprise. Next one, please. Uh, and market, will it sell? Um, sometimes I get people all excited about growing something and they say, well, this will grow really well here. And I say, yes, but is anybody going to want to pay you for the, for the product? So that will it sell is the other one. And then can you make money at it? And so I'm going to talk about some different case studies next and whether or not um, they're going to work. So a few things to consider. Small, small scale means high value per acre. And so you need to think about what makes a crop high value. Go ahead and so high value in general usually means high labor inputs. It can mean perishable in terms of short post-harvest life and difficult to transport, or it can mean something that's really unique that you can't find otherwise in the market. So those are the, the factors that you need to consider. So um, the first case study I wanna talk about is apples. Will are apples a good scenario? Number one, I would say skill level is to get a highly marketable fruit like this one shown here with no blemishes and everything looks good and the size and quality are really good it does take a considerable skill to do that consistently and then infrastructure becomes another important thing you're talking about sprayers to, to protect the crop forklifts to move the crop coolers to, to preserve it or get it chilled down so you it'll it'll keep all these things are quite expensive to do and there's economies of scale so trying to do this on a half acre scale is becomes really challenging uh, next so storage and transport is another issue so apples keep really well once you've got them chilled you can you store and transport them for long distances so the next thing and, and also there's no premium for a local apple typically if we go to the grocery store we expect them all to be the same so that makes it really hard for us to compete against say Washington or New York or even some of the large scale fruit producers in Utah 
We also have Southern Hemisphere production coming from Chile and New Zealand and, and so forth out of season. So it's really hard to compete in this type of scenario. Are there niche opportunities? Possibly, um, if you've got a variety that's not available in the grocery stores, that can be a niche opportunity. Another niche opportunity might be growing uh, them for value-added processing. So growing apples that you're gonna process into pies or growing uh, one of the hot new niche areas is in uh, hard cider. So growing specific varieties that are used to ferment for hard cider. Sheridan, you can go ahead and advance though. So those are some of the niche opportunities. Let's move on to the next one. One of the ones that's popular for a couple of reasons that I'm gonna outline are raspberries. Because there's fairly minimal infrastructure if we compare them to apples. Uh, so they do have a short post-harvest life. Raspberries, once you get them picked, they, you gotta get them sold pretty quickly and they don't travel well. So they're can and should be, you should be charging a premium for local fruit because it's fresh and it's it's high quality. I've, I've got some kind of rough estimates here in terms of potential income. So we've done variety trials at Kaysville and depending on the variety and the year, we, we average from 3,000 to 8,500 pounds of fruit per acre. So that's pretty good yields. I've used pricing from the North American Raspberry and Blackberry Association survey. That's a national survey conducted in 2018 where they asked the members what they were charging for pre-picked. And the, the average across the US was 842 per pound pre-picked. So that gives you 26 to 75,000, 74,000 per acre as potential gross income. So that's a, a nice high value crop. The question is, can you get that kind of pricing in your local market? And, and that really varies from location to location from even within the state of Utah. The other question is labor. And my next slide talks a little bit more about labor. Um, so this is a, a enterprise budget from Penn State University where they break out uh, fresh red raspberries and what the, what the cost to produce is. And based on their calculations and their estimates, if you've got really good pickers, if you've got fast folks that are really efficient um, and you're gonna have to pay them more. So if you, if you get like H2A workers and, and they're really good at picking raspberries, you've got to pay them between 15 to $20 an hour. If they're, if they're H2A, you got to pay them, I think it's 15, 50 roughly per hour, plus their um, housing costs and transportation costs, and it ends up being close to 20. So if you got really good pickers, 87% of your cost of production is labor. And if you've got slow pickers like your, your neighborhood high school kids, um, then you're gonna be up around 94% of your harvest labor, even though you're paying them less than half as much. The other issue is that this, the labor is seasonal. It's concentrated at harvest. So it's not something that one person can really do efficiently. Now you can go with the you pick route where they, the, the customer is gonna pick their own berries. If you do that, you're gonna get a lower price than what I quoted. You've gotta deal with parking and traffic where they've got to have a place to park if they're going to come to your farm. And that can eat up quite a bit of ground on a, on a small scale. You also have to worry about crop damage. You've got the, the soccer mom bringing their kids out for an afternoon of entertainment, and they're going to break off more canes than the fruit they pick usually. So that's one of the issues, and there's going to be wasted fruit. So there's other issues that you have to, um, that you have to be thinking about when you go you pick. Um, Another crop that we can talk about, blackberries similar to raspberries are minimal infrastructure um, and some of the same issues, high value per acre, short post-harvest life. Uh, Sheridan, if you, I'm not sure if it's advancing. Um, so here's, I, I put up some value, some values here. We, we've done blackberries at our Kaysville farm. We don't get the kind of yields that other states get just because we're higher elevation. We tend to get some winter injury. At Kaysville, we got 0.6 to 1.6 pounds per plant. Um, and at 870 plants per acre, which is what our spacing, that's 500 to 1400 pounds per acre. The, the pricing again was from that North American Raspberry and Blackberry Association, 646 per pound pre-picked. And that gives you 35 to 9,000 per acre as gross 
uh, revenue potential for blackberries. But again, pricing and labor is an issue. If you're going to do pre-picked, it's a lot of labor. Um, another one I want to talk about is strawberries. There tend to be, I would say, moderate infrastructure. They do have a short post-harvest life. The yields depend on production system. And I want to talk really briefly here about production systems. So here at the bottom, I've got, we've got low tunnels here on the left in the field. We've got, here's a high tunnel structure with a low tunnel inside of it. And that's really, um, th those are much more involved in terms of infrastructure than just this field production. So your yields are going to depend on production. If we can go to the next slide, Sheridan, that should. Uh, so this graph shows what the typical yields that we got at a trial that we did here in Cache Valley. Hello, this is Ruby. The first one is unprotected. The next one is low tunnels only. Um, and then we go to high tunnel only and low tunnel plus high tunnel. You can see with the, the low tunnel and high tunnel combinations, we were at one and a quarter to a pound and a half to pound and three quarters per plant yields. Whereas if we were out in the field or just using low tunnels alone, we were less than a quarter of a pound of fruit per plant. So you can see really the, the, the yields to get above a pound per plant, which is you know really where you want to be. You've got to have a high tunnel at least. And then you're up around a pound and a half to a pound and three quarters. Uh, Sheridan, if you, there we go. So yields, if we're thinking 1.2 to 1 point ounce, eight pounds per plant and 17 to 20,000 plants per acre, that's really where we wanna be with this type of a system and, and what we can do with a tunnel. Then you can see there what the values are in terms of pricing for, for fruit. I've got you pick, I've got wholesale and I've got retail. Those come from the New York State Berry uh, market analysis. So you can see there what the gross returns might be, uh, assuming 1.2 to 1.8 pounds and 17 to 20,000 pounds per acre. Um, and those prices, there should be a slide coming up, Sheridan, with the. Um, so I, I just used kind of conservative estimates there, the low end of the production per plant, 17,000 pounds per acre. And you're looking at sixty to one hundred twenty thousand dollars per acre gross returns on strawberries if you can get those prices. So that's a uh, a good one. So a lot of the information. I guess the the bottom line with strawberries is if you're going to do it, I would do it with high tunnels. If you don't, your yields are going to be so low that it's it's really challenging. And and that a big part of that is just being able to protect the blossoms in the spring. We get temperature fluctuations. We lose a lot of fruit to spring frosts. So that is really what it takes. Let's talk about some other crops. I've kind of covered some of the main ones. Um, this next one, some of you may recognize, this is goji berry. And I oftentimes will, people ask me, should I, you know, these, I love these goji berries. I get them from the, the health food store. Should I grow them? Let's, let's talk about some of the principles. First of all, they're thorny and messy to grow. They're extremely tedious to harvest. The fruit doesn't separate very easily and, and they don't come in kind of clusters. So you got to pick them. And then they're hand dried and fruit is about 90% water. So if you think about that package that you're buying from the health food store, they're, pick, they're hand picked and they're hand dried in, in most of them are coming from China. And so when you're out there hand picking them and going through the, that tedious process, the thing that I always, and I've picked these things, I know, the thing that comes to my mind is I'm competing, my labor is competing against peasant labor in China. Really, that's, that's what you're up against because once they're dried, they have a long post-harvest life. And so that's really the challenge. Is your time worth more than that? Let's go on to the next one. So elderberries, these are, uh, the common elderberry on the top is, grown throughout North America. Locally, we have this blue elderberry, which is the, the wild blue elderberry that, that grows in the mountains around here. Um, we they're recommended to plant about 450 plants the acre, um, two to four quarts per plant. That gives you an idea of our harvest. They're fairly easy to harvest. You can clip the clusters instead of the individual fruit and then freeze them and then basically thresh the fruit off the, the clusters or sell them as whole clusters. The challenge here, though, is that really people don't buy fresh elderberries. They're looking to get some value added, whether it's uh, elderberry flower tea, which is common, whether it's a syrup or jelly or juice made from the, the harvested fruit. Um, 
they have to be processed in some way. And so either you've got to find a market for the fruit or you've got to develop a commercial kitchen, which is a whole different issue. One thing where I think this could be really useful in a, in a micro scale type of environment is they make nice windbreaks and, and it's a windbreak that you could harvest the fruit from and um, have that product to, to have available, whether you're harvesting the fruit or the flowers, which there's also a market for. But, but if you're gonna do anything value added, you've gotta have a commercial kitchen. And we do have a fact sheet on elderberry production that I have shown there at the bottom. Let's go on to the next one. Other ones, I've got information on our, on our website about service berry, about choke cherry. Those are some of, an elderberry, which are some of the natives. Uh, if you go down, there's um, the information on goji's hascap, which we're gonna have a talk about tomorrow. If you, if you tune into the berry session, we've got a group from Montana that's been working with hascap. So you might wanna tune in there which is another possibility. So there's a lot of these out there, but you need to, again, think about what's your labor situation. If they require processing, are you going to go into having a commercial kitchen and dealing with that? Or can you find a market for the unprocessed berries? So that's kind of there. So coming back to the issue, we need to think about the whole package. We, if we're missing a, a leg from our stool, then it's gonna be hard for us to, to have that as a profitable and, and rewarding experience as a small acreage situation. And that's all I have. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I guess we're gonna do some of those live now and then I, I will hop on after the next presenter starts and, and type in some answers in the Q&A as well. Any, any live questions, Sheridan? Um, I'm not seeing any come in now. Um, so if you guys want to type in questions in the Q&A, you're more than welcome to. Oh, there's a question that came up. What about yeah. sea berry? So sea berry or sea buckthorn, um, those are also, I, I would kind of clump those in with, um, with goji and I don't, I'm not trying to knock them, but my, my, I've grown them by the way, before I came to Utah, I was in Maryland and we, we were growing them and looking at them. Number one, very thorny. The, 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 besides sea berry, they're known as sea buckthorn and emphasis on thorn. They're hard to pick. Um, they, they're really high in vitamin C, so there's a lot of health benefits, but they're hard to harvest and you've really got to find a market and that can be a real challenge. So the labor and the marketing issues can be a real problem. Uh, there's um, one more, I'll, I'll go to the next one. How yeah, is living Molly. next? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to tell you, Molly has a question. If you can, yeah. that would be great. How does living next to a mountain affect the sunlight needs of, of plants? Okay. We live at the base of mountain, depends on where the sun hit during different seasons. So typically um, we get, so, so that has to do with the aspect and that's talked about in that site selection fact sheet that I cited. But typically what happens is on a west facing slope, you get more sun, you get um higher heat units than on an east facing slope and a north facing slope is even less. South facing slope is, um, it can be problematic because plants tend to wanna to try and start growing too early in the spring and then they get, um, they get frost damage. So we get, we need to, when I talk about shade, if you can get full sunlight for a good part of the day, even if you're next to a mountain, you're gonna get full sunlight for a good, you know, maybe not as long as out on a prairie, but you're gonna still get good sunlight. Where I talk about shading affecting fruit quality, it's where you've got, you know, people will say, well, strawberries will grow in the shade underneath my, my apple tree. Well, that's true, but those strawberries aren't gonna be worth eating. So they, they do need to get sunlight for part of the day. And in our high elevation desert climate, a little bit of shade in the afternoon can be a good thing with the berries because we do see damage from, from getting too hot. So there's, there's microclimate issues to do with sun that you need to be thinking about. Okay, Stephanie would like to know how can we best locate the case studies and links that you referenced in your presentation? Okay, right. so fruit.usu.edu is our, is our or tunnel.usu.edu. It'll take you to the same site and we've got all of the fact sheets that I've talked about posted on that site. Um, and, and you can go in there and there's berry, se berry section and a vegetable section and even a cut flower section. So all of the, all the information that we're gonna be talking about today 
can be accessed from that website. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to remind everyone, if